this is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll be in conversation with Dr. Anthony Montero, the Boisean scholar and lifelong activist. I'll be posing the question to him. Will there be a race war in the United States? Stay tuned. A race war. Is that where the United States is headed? Uh, Today I have Dr. Anthony Montero. He is a scholar and a community organizer and uh, creator of the Free School in Philadelphia. Dr. Montero, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. Thank you very much, Sabrina. It's really nice to be with you again. Absolutely. I felt it was imperative to speak to you, of all people, uh, given your work in the community um, and, you know, your lifelong work as a a community organizer and activist um, and and just as an African-American scholar, a Du Boisian scholar, if you would, um, to talk about what is happening right now um, with the four congresswomen um, and with Trump's remarks. And finally, with the media, you know, finally putting on their big, their big adult pants and saying and calling what Trump is and what he said for what it really is and who he really is. Calling him out, finally. He is a racist. What he said about, um, it, it was racist. It was blatantly racist. But that's something that we've already known. We've always known that. Every time I watch some news coverage about it, it's like they're, they're talking about it like it's something new. You know, and, and oh, the Republican Party, and, and, and that's what the Republican Party is known for now. They've always been known for that. Both parties actually have been known for that. It is a reality that black folks especially and people of color, color generally are already aware of. So why, why, let me start with this, you know, why are they trying to paint this as something new and, and, and horrible and, you know, a detriment to society? And, and you know, why, why are they trying to treat this like this is a, a, a new event, a big deal? Well, the first question I would ask is when has the corporate media not been a part of the white supremacist institutional exactly. yes. system? So uh, why are they now uh, so alarmed by Trump's racism and nativism when they themselves have been that uh, uh, for who can say how long? Uh, I think that, you know, we uh, we have to do our own critical thinking and our own strategizing. Uh, I think the corporate media has its own agenda. Uh, which is uh, to weaponize the question of race and white supremacy in order to put the Democrats uh, back in power. Uh, Now, I'm against white supremacy. I'm against nativism. I'm against xenophobia. But I'm also against the the corporate Democratic Party. Uh, And in fact, uh, that party uh, is and has been for some time a party of war and a party of white supremacy need we do more than to look back to the mid-1990s and the Clinton administration's crime and anti-terrorism bill, which then became a model for states, uh, which went after black people and led to the greatest uh, incarceration system, maybe in the history of humanity, certainly in the history of modern uh bourgeois democratic legalities uh and the um at the same in the same year the clinton administration's welfare reform which was based upon stereotypes of uh black women uh getting rich off of doing nothing the so-called welfare queen uh stereotype so uh i don't get uh exceptionally moved by the narrow framework of the current debate. Uh, I know you have asked the question, are we on the cusp of a race war? And that is a question 
that can only be answered if, if, first of all, we define what we mean when we say race in this country, and then, of course, what we mean when we say race war. You know, the greatest, and I put quotes here, race war in the history of the United States, maybe one of the great, quote, race wars in the history of modernity was the American Civil War, which was about slavery, uh, ultimately, and about race, ultimately. Uh, so I, I am uh, I'm really prepared uh, to think about think this through and actually to uh, talk about the moment in history uh, that we're in and whether or not we're talking about race war or whether or not we're talking about the unraveling and the uh, undoing of a system that has proven itself unable to govern the nation uh, and uh, unable to provide for the people. Uh, does that put us on the cusp of race war? Or do, does that put us on the cusp of civil war and class war? I think those are the questions that we have to ask. I agree. I absolutely agree. And which is definitely going to take us into the second half of the show on um, talking about where we can go from here. Um, but I definitely want to keep hitting on this because it feels like we're on the precipice of something exploding. You know, the epiphany of, of something just a, a major shift. You know, I, I think shift is actually a, a mild word for it. A, a, just a major change. I think we're about to fall off the cliff um, with this race baiting that is coming from Trump and his administration and Stephen Miller and all that, you know, that his whole, you know, gang of thieves and his, you know, his swampy cohorts. Um, so with that, where is, where do you, I don't really see a strategy is from Trump per se, but I do see it from the people surrounding him. Where do you think they are trying to push things because that's what it feels like. It feels like we're, we're on the we're on the edge, we're on the verge of a race war. They're stoking the the, the flames, you know. They're, they're they're stoking the coals. They're getting people riled up. They're getting that base riled up. Um, do you think that we're about to step into that realm of all out fighting, um, a la Charlottesville, 2017? Well, I'd have to say I. I I don't see that as the trajectory. Why uh, is that? I, what I see more than anything else are, uh, are almost like political battles, civil wars among white people. Mm. More than uh, a united white population against black folk or people of color for that matter. I don't see that. Mm. Um, what I see is the... Uh, fragmenting of the political system, the collapse of what Arthur Schlesinger called the vital center. Mm -hmm. So we're in one of those situations of a zero-sum game. If one side wins, the other side loses. Uh, and they're throwing vitriol and and uh, uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, definitions of the other side that almost say that uh, we're in a, a point of no return. Uh, this election, I think, is being fought out as just that. I mean, uh, the so-called, and I put quotes, liberals and the so-called left mm -hmm. against the, this populist white movement. Um, and uh, Trump is being called on respectable corporate media outlets not just a fascist, but a Nazi, uh, and uh, having committed treason, not just impeachable crimes, but treason. He is calling his opponents treasonous and anti-American. Uh, this battle is essentially, in spite of the fact of the four uh, Congresswomen of color, in spite of that, this battle is essentially among white folk over what each side sees as the future of this country or whether or not this country even has a future in the current configuration. Uh, that, that's kind of the way I see it. It is a complex 
uh, dialectic being actualized in this country at this time. We have no precedent for it except maybe the Civil War of the 1860s. But other than that, we have no precedents for it. This is the deepest crisis politically that the nation has experienced since that time. Now, race war. Race will always be implicit, if not explicit, in all of the contradictions that affect this country. Uh, I would not argue that that means that we're on the cusp of race war. I mean, I think more than anything, we're in the throes of a great conflict about the future of this country. The combatants at this time are essentially two sides of the white population politically in this country. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And you feel and you're seeing that this is a war that's being fought within right. the white community. Within the white population. Within the white population. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and you are listening to Pacific Radio KPFA 94.1 FM. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. This is A Rude Awakening, and I am having a conversation with Dr. Anthony Montero. Is there going to be a race war here in the United States? That's the question, and he's given us answers. Stay tuned. attempting to define its opponents and not allowing the opponent the opportunity to define themselves. Now, this is uniquely American politics. Uh, it is not 
uh, deep uh, thinking or platforms. You know, we're, you know, this is 2019. You know, we're over a year and a half away from uh, the election itself. Maybe not a year and a half, but, you know, a year and several months away from the election itself. And already it's like the election was around the corner and already issues of substance are not being discussed. But uh, this kind of cheap campaigning is going on. Mm. Uh, You know, socialism, uh, a good part of the younger generation says that it favors socialism uh, over capitalism. Now, what all that means, we're not certain. Uh, A significant part of the population generally say it favors socialism. Uh, And and that makes sense uh, since capitalism, uh, since the Great Recession, the financial collapse in the Great Recession of 2008, uh, capitalism has failed. Uh, hundreds of millions, a hundred million, or let's say a hundred million people, at least in this country, uh, in spite of the unemployment numbers, uh, people aren't making enough to really uh, survive off of. And then you got gentrification. You got so many problems, the collapse of public education and an infrastructure that is so outdated that it's dangerous to the population. Uh, now, to to repair any of this will require, uh, if not full socialism, some form of state capitalism a la Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And then even then we don't know if any of the problems that confront this country can be solved short of a revolution of of the economic system, a whole new economic system. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you put on top of that uh, the world situation, the rise of Asia, uh, the decline of the United States, and on and on and on. We are in a world the likes of which none of us have ever experienced and problems the likes of which none of us have confronted. And on top of that, Uh, a lack of political leadership and intellectual leadership that could even begin to ask the right questions. Uh, That's the way I see it. Definitely. Um... And you know, Sabrina, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I I guess uh, I've been around long enough not to uh, respond to every event, uh, every word, every claim Uh, made uh, by the media or people who are players or have access to the media. Uh, I think there are other uh, other dynamics, other dialectics, uh, they're both historical and um, uh, political. Uh, I think there is a mass of people whose words, whose voices, whose conditions are hardly ever spoken of. Here I'm talking about the working class. I'm talking about the poor. I'm talking about young people, especially young working class and poor people. You know, uh, their voices, their interests uh, are seldom brought into any of these discussions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's my methodology or my epistemology if you will. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, definitely, I will. <laughs> point, point well taken. Point well yeah. taken and point well put. I'll definitely give you that. Always, always. Um, and, and and with this, and, and we're going to end up rounding out this conversation, Dr. Montero, with hope, because that's what I hear from you, hope. Um hope in the young people, hope in the working class people, the right. working poor, you know, hope that there will be this uprising uh, or this rising up of that segment of the population, which actually makes up a pretty large part of the United States, mm-hmm. you know, because we only got a few percent that are, you know, own almost all of the wealth here in this country, right? Right. right. Right, absolutely. So that takes me to the next question. Um, you are the creator and director, founder of the, the Free School in Philadelphia. Um, and 
educating folks of all shapes, sizes, and colors about, right. you know, how they can activate themselves and how they can empower themselves uh, through learning about the past, through your Du Boisian teachings. Um, and do you, do you see something like that happening? I'm, I'm starting to notice it myself uh, here in California. Um, are you seeing that on the East Coast in your travels, uh, different types of organizations popping up and, and uh, just basically trying to educate people and trying to get them into the know as far as politics are concerned, as far as politics of this country are concerned, world politics, and how they can take their power back and take their wealth back, essentially, to move this country out of this racially divided chasm that we've fallen into. Yeah. I, you know, I especially see a great yearning to know the world on the part of young people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that we're starting to think about here is to assault these universities who are not only uh, centers of gentrification mm -hmm. and behemoths of neoliberal uh, ideology and practice, um, but also elitist and do not produce knowledge for the people. One of the things that we're trying to talk about here is how to put forward an agenda to unite the students in these universities and whatever progressive professors there are with the communities to once again raise the question of should these universities be elite um, uh, citadels or should they serve the masses? Mm. Uh, should they be free universities? Should the uh, lecture halls and laboratories and playing fields uh, become liberated uh, so that the communities of poor and working people uh, might avail themselves of these resources? Uh, so one of the things we're looking at with Temple and the University of Pennsylvania is... Uh, liberating, emancipating part of these universities as uh, liberated zones uh, for the working class, the poor, and their families. Uh, the other thing for us here in the city of Philadelphia is to once again put the masses of working people in touch with their histories. Uh, that's why we talk about Baldwin and Du Bois and Ropes and and King and Malcolm and and uh, Coretta and uh, you yes. know just Elaine Brown, all of these uh, revolutionary figures. What were their insights? Uh, what what did they imagine as the future? And how do we build upon their thinking and practice? Um, you know, uh, people who are ignorant of their history are, are condemned to repeat it over and over and over again. That's right. And that goes as much for nations, that goes as much for the working class and, and the black people and the poor as it does for uh, nations. Uh, one of the things that the uh, collapse of public education has meant is that you can go to the University of Pennsylvania in the College of Liberal Arts or Temple in Africana Studies and not know who James Baldwin is. Mm. And I'm not exaggerating. It's not taught. And if you don't know James Baldwin, how would you even know Paul Robeson? That's right. I mean, and it's so deep here because Paul Robeson died, lived his last 10 or 12 years in Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia, died here. And the mm. majority of, of young people or people in general don't even know his name and there's a reason for that uh john coltrane emerges as this great musical figure in philadelphia and there are people a lot of people who don't even know who john coltrane is wow. that says something mm -hmm. to go forward it cannot just be our anger our spontaneous uh response to things that but we at least a part of us have to be ideologically, politically, and culturally aware. And that's that's kind of what we're doing here in Philadelphia. And I encourage people to do it all over this country. I mean, mm -hmm. you know? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. They need, it needs to be done. It needs to be repeated. The Free School of Philadelphia, created, founded by Dr. Anthony Montero, scholar, community organizer, lifelong activist. Um, do you have any last words for us as we embark on this week of bellicosity and vitriol? <laughs> well, Give us I would some say hope, yes. Dr. I mean, Montero. Well, we need yeah. some hope. Well, <laughs> well, hope, I would say, uh, I'm not Jesse Jackson, so I'm not going to say keep hope alive. <laughs> Please but, don't. Please yeah. don't. No, don't, I, won't, don't. <laughs> I won't go there. But you know, Sabrina, um, one thing we have to say, we're in the throes of a deep crisis, a systemic crisis, a crisis of of a, of a civilization, Western and American civilization. Mm -hmm. It is a great crisis. At the same time, one, as is my case, can be um, optimistic, realistically so, some would say cautiously so, but I like to say realistically optimistic because the United States is not the totality of humanity. Uh, humanity will move forward with or without the United States. Um, we have every reason uh, to see our future as part of the future of Asia and Africa and Latin America. Um, in that sense, boundaries, national boundaries, do not speak to the future of all of humanity. Uh, so I am optimistic when I look at the world I'm optimistic when I look at what young people aspire to. Um, and I think that it will not be easy. I think we are in one of the most difficult times. And I went through the 60s and 70s and beyond. And I saw that time and the difficulty of that moment. Mm -hmm. This will be far more difficult. The dangers are much greater, but I think the people of the United States uh, are, and especially black folk, interestingly, are able to come to an understanding of what they must do to, to guarantee that they have a future. That's right. That's right. Dr. Anthony Montero, thank you so much for imparting your knowledge on us, on our listening audience. We truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show once again. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I appreciate you. All right. Appreciate you too, bro. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guest, Dr. Anthony Montero, for taking the time. The lovely Lucrecia Burton is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Hard Knock Radio is up next. Have a wonderful week of resistance community. And thank you for listening. KPFA, may I take your pledge? Attention KPFA listeners. KPFA Summer Fun Drive starts on Tuesday, July 23rd. During this time, we invite you to come down to our phone room and volunteer your time and help us by answering phone calls and taking pledges. No experience is necessary. Our phone rooms open at 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekends. Snacks, coffee, and tea will be provided. Please visit KPFA.